Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Fibonacci oscillators and uh, two parameter, uh, you know, the formations of Lorentz transformation. <coughs> this is a paper that appeared in this, in this journal. And the reason I'm going to talk about this is because since you've been working with Fibonacci chains for a long time, and Marcelo is interested in quantum groups, this may be very useful for you, okay? So I'm going to skip, I'm not going to give the talk in absolute order, but let me just, <coughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how do I, I def define a deformation, a two-parameter deformation of an integer or of a number. So P and Q represents the two parameters that, you know, because in general, uh, people who work with quantum groups usually w work with a one-parameter deformation of, of your quantum symmetry. Here I'm working with two parameters, and you'll see why two parameters are very, very important. And it's related to the golden mean and the Fibonacci numbers. Um, okay, so I will talk a little bit, and then I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Fibonacci numbers, and then the generalized version of the Fibonacci numbers. And then I'll talk a little bit about <coughs> PQ oscillators, and how you deform uh, the two parameter deformations of the Lorentz group, for example. Then, for you guys, probably the most important part for, for you here at, at QGR, QGR is this, the Fibonacci chains. How I'm going to construct the notion of Fibonacci chain. I'm going to uh, tell you how to construct an oscillator. And maybe this Fibonacci oscillator may be related to the notion of these empire waves that you are very interested in. Okay, so let me just, um, I'm going to uh, skip a little bit, go backwards and forwards in time. I'm so sorry because I, I uh, when I wrote this down, um, let me just, uh, if I can go here, let me just, I have to go. And then I'll go back in time. Okay, so the, the important thing is how do you define a, a deformation of a number, whether it's an integral number or, or a real number? So the two parameter deformation is given by this expression over here. You know, you take uh, P and Q, parameterize your deformation. So this is the definition of how you deform a, a number. When P and Q are both equal to 1, then you will have the numerator will become zero, the denominator becomes zero, and zero divided by zero is undetermined. But then when you use L'Hopital's rule, you can show that, in fact, when P and Q are both uh, one, the quantum deformation is automatically trivial. So the deformation of N is just N. You know, you'll recover the usual number. But in general, when P and Q, you know, they could be real numbers, they could be also complex numbers. But uh, today I'll be talking about real numbers. Okay, so uh, um, in you, when, when, you say, when P and Q are both equal to each other, in that case, P and Q, if P is equal to Q, then you recover the natural deformation of a, of a number, which is given by this. And then later on, I will talk a little bit about uh, quantum calculus. But given this definition of, of a number, or the, how you deform a number, I'm going to go backwards, and, and then I'm going to tell you where the golden mean and the Fibonacci sequence comes from. Um, okay. Voila, voila. Okay, so all of you uh, are familiar that the golden mean is, is given by the solution of a quadratic equation, and this is the definition of the golden mean, right? And, and, and the Galois conjugate, you just reverse the sign here, and instead of having a plus square root of 5, you had a negative square root of 5. So you say, you say that P and Q are what Galois conjugates of each other. And this is how you construct Dirichlet's integers. Okay? So, so what happens is when you use the definition of a, of a, de, of a quantum deformation of a number, when P equals to the golden mean and Q equals the Galois, the Galois conjugate, uh, due to the famous formula by Binet, you know, and then I'll show you a little bit how you derive it, it happens that this quantum deformation of a number becomes equal to the Fibonacci numbers. So you could, you could think of the Fibonacci numbers, which are integers, as deformations, two-parameter deformations of the ordinary integers. 
when P and Q are given by the golden mean and its, and its Galois conjugate. Okay, so you could think of the Fibonacci numbers as quantum deformations of the ordinary numbers. And why is this important? Because, as you know, for many years, uh, you know, the Penrose quasi-crystal is just one flower, one beautiful flower, in the garden of non-commutative geometry. So the idea is to try to connect uh, non-commutative geometry and quantum calculus with the physics of quasi-crystals. Anyway, this was the, my motivation to, to, to present this, this talk to, to you guys. Now, uh, now you, are you familiar with this expression when you raise the golden mean to the power of n? Why do you get, do you, do you know how to derive these relations? Do you know where they come from? The yeah. derivation? Uh, Fine remembers? Yeah, this, yeah. we did this before. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it becomes a Lucas number, right? So mm -hmm. the phi to the power of n is Lucas n. Yeah, yeah, but the derivation. Uh, let me just uh, quickly, for, for those of you who are not experts in quasi crystals, le let me just remind you of this derivation. Oh, Scheiße, Scheiße. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, let me just, let me just, uh, if you remember the golden triangle, the inflation rules and the, of the golden triangles. If I remember, if you have this, uh, this matrix, is it one, 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 zero, Ray? Or is it the, or the one is over here? Anyway, okay, when you raise this to the power of n, what you'll get is, is, is a, a, a matrix com comprised what you have, the Fibonacci number here, a Fibonacci number here, and an n plus one over here, and an n minus one over here. I forgot something like this. So this is the inflation rule of the golden triangle. When you, uh, you know, when you raise this matrix to the power of n, you you reproduce the Fibonacci numbers in the right hand side. So it happens that the when you compute the eigenvalues of this matrix, the eigenvalues are of this uh, matrix are given by the golden mean and the Galois conjugate, which is, is a Pissot BJ, a, a Garavan number, a PV number. Uh, okay, so the eigenvalues of this matrix are given by the golden mean and the Galois conjugate. And of course, so that's why when you raise T to the N, uh, this is why you're going to have, this is how you're going to derive these relationships. This is where they come from. Okay, so the important thing is when you raise t to the power of n, you're going to recover a, a, a number, which is given by the Fibonacci number, and then you're going to have a 1 over t here, and vice versa. When you take the inverse, you, you have this relationship, you know. Now, the, the golden mean, okay, phi is usually the inverse of t, you know. Some people use phi, and they call phi this number. But anyway, what I, I mean, you know what I mean by the golden mean. And the inverse, you know that uh, uh, 1 over t, you know, it, it gives you the phi. Okay, the important thing is, the most important thing is that the, the quantum group, I mean, the quantum deformation of the integers, when p and q are given by the golden mean and the Galois conjugates, is the Fibonacci numbers. So you can think of the Fibonacci integers as deformations of the ordinary integers when P and Q are given by the golden mean and the Galois conjugate. Uh, okay, so, so these numbers is what you call the Dirichlet integers. Uh, any number of this form is a Dirichlet integers. So these really are Dirichlet integers in a certain way. But just, mm -hmm. I just don't want what I said to go to waste. Yeah. The, the, the phi to the n is L to the n, where L is a Lucas number, but Lucas numbers are the same basically as the Fibonacci series. In other words, Fibonacci series is that the, you know, the ratio between any two sequential Fibonacci numbers approximates the golden ratio and the series converges. Yeah. The, the Lucas series is the same thing. The, the, the ratio between any two yeah. is a, is a, uh, is a, is a, uh, uh, approximation of the golden ratio and it converges equally as fast mm -hmm. and it's um, they're really just forms of one another where you start the additive series with either you know you could start the additive series with two or yeah. you can start the additive series um, 
as you do with the Fibonacci series. But with, it's, you start yeah. with zero and one, right? Right, right. Yeah, whereas yeah. the Lucas series, you start with two. So, oh, okay. it, but, it, but the additive series converges to phi equally yeah. as fast, and the ratio between any <clears throat> two uh, equally approximates the golden ratio, yeah. depending on how far. It's just a shorter way to write it, because yeah. when you write when you write that equation as just phi to the n equals Lucas number to the n, you don't have to have as many symbols. It's a more it's more direct. It's oh, I, I the see. correspondence to is I, to the Lucas series. I see. But you can do all the same kind of physics and get your Fibonacci chains. Yes. In other words, Lucas series gives Fibonacci chains. I see. I see. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now, um, now, do you, do you see that when you? You have this combination of numbers, you generate the, the Fibonacci numbers. Now, the generalized Fibonacci numbers, <coughs> you know, imagine you have the Galois conjugate pairs. You see, where now m is a square free integer. Okay? Uh, so you want to make sure that m is not a perfect square. So let's start with numbers that look like this, where m is any square free integer. So uh, Whitford, you know, many years ago, generalized the Binet formula in this form. Now, because remember, before, what, what do I have before? I have the golden mean to the power of n, and then I have the, the Galois conjugate to the power of, of, um, of, of n also. Uh, so here, the analog of this is this, you know, when m is equal to the square root of 5, you recover the golden mean and the Galois conjugate. So now m is any integer that, is, that doesn't have, it's not a perfect square. So let's raise this to the power of n, raise this to the power of n, and I divide by the square root of m, because before I, I was dividing by the square root of 5. So this is what you call a generalized Fibonacci number. And in general, this, this, uh, these numbers are the solutions to a quadratic, a quadratic equation, you know? Remember the other day you were telling me that when you look at the Mandelbrot set, uh, you have these Fibonacci numbers in the, bulbs. in the bulbs, you know. So here, and remember, the, the Mandelbrot set is, is you know, is really, is really the, the, when you construct this quadratic iteratic equation, you know. In, in, anyway, right. so here look, you look at the solutions of this equation where m is not necessary, um, it's not a square free number, so you, you, then you can generalize this sequence of number. So, and if you set the first two numbers equals to one, so this is the analog of the Fibonacci sequence, okay? Because you see, when m equals to five, you know, five minus one is four, four divided by four is one, so you recover the, the ordinary Fibonacci sequence. So in other words, the Fibonacci sequence is the, is, is, is the first uh, element of this hierarchy of Fibonacci se or generalized Fibonacci sequences. So the golden mean is, is, your, is your first basic number, and these other numbers are just the, the, the relatives, the cousins of the, of the golden mean, you can think, you know, in a very pedestrian way. Um, uh, and now, of course, notice that these numbers are, non, are no longer necessarily integers. You, you, you are going to generate fractions. So the only way you can get an integer here is when m minus 1 divided by 4 is, a, is, is, a, is an integer. So when m equals 4k plus 1, then this will be an integer, and these generalized Fibonacci numbers will be integers. And why is this important for... for quasi-crystals, because remember, when k equals to 1, you get 4 plus 1 is 5, and you're, and you're going to get this five-fold uh, symmetry in your quasi-crystals, right? When k equals to 2, uh, you get 8 plus 1 is 9, but 9, you see, the, it's a perfect square, so it doesn't really count. So the next one will be 13, the next one will be 17, and so forth. So in this way, this, these numbers are... Um, you see, the golden mean is associated with the five-fold symmetry of the Penrose quasi-crystal. So what I'm saying here is that uh, when you look at this, um, this generalized uh, Fibonacci numbers w are connected with this 4K plus 1-fold symmetry of a quasi-crystal. So this could be very important f to construct quasi-crystals with a 4K plus 1-fold rotational symmetry. Okay. 
Well, the golden mean is the first element. You know, the, the Penrose crystal will be the first family member. Anyway, so this is why I think it's important, you know. But the main point here is to connect this with, with a quantum calculus, to look at the formations of these numbers, okay? When P and Q are gal gal conjugates of each other. Okay, so let me go back a little bit. Uh, you know, what do I mean by a, P a PQ oscillator, you know? So imagine you have, you know, in ordinary oscillators, you have this creation and annihilation operators. So here, in order to construct the deformation of your oscillators, you, know, you just, what you do is you just deform the number operator by, the, you know, I gave you the expression how, how this number is defined. I, I told you before that this number is defined by, you know, P to the N minus Q to the N divided by P minus Q. So the formation of your oscillators is given by this. Your annihilation creation operator gives you this relationship. Um, and then when you reverse the order, you get this. And this, are your, this is the, or the ordinary um, commutation and anti-commutation relations of these PQ oscillators. Uh, I notice, if maybe, I, I think maybe, uh, that this number, uh, you have this recursion relation, which looks like a Fibonacci recursion relation for these oscillators. Carlos? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Does, um, or Marcelo or anybody, is there, is there a way that maybe Fibonacci anion fusion rules where you have creation and annihilation in a, in a, if you want to use those words, right? Yeah. Just transpose those words yeah. we, where, where we have the ability with the Fibonacci anions, they can merge or one can separate into two. And that's like a creation annihilation operator that relates very deeply to the simple form of the of these of this Fibonacci based fusion rules I was just wondering if there's like a connection that you see with Fibonacci anion you know uh, yeah yes I, I think you could try to uh, construct uh, you know a quantum field theory based on this creation and annihilation operators and then you deform them you deform using this uh, because I'm talking about these numbers are deformed and I'm playing with the golden mean. Yes, 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 yes. And let me just go back. Um, what did I do? What did I do? Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Let me just go to the oscillators and then I go back to your, uh, your algebraic structure. Uh, what do I have here? Okay. Ah, okay. Bosonic and Fermino oscillators are very special cases. So when you have the golden mean and the Galois conjugate, I have this uh, Fibonacci recursion relationship. And uh, one thing I would like to mention, have you heard about this ma Indian mathematicians and Sanskrit poet? You know, it was Hemachandra and this Sanskrit poet, Biranka and Gopala, that uh, many, many, many years before Fibonacci discovered these numbers. So the Fibonacci numbers were discovered by the Indian guys, oh, okay. thousands of years before Fibonacci. Oh, <laughs> so they are called, really, uh, if you talk to an Indian mathematician, no, they are not the Fibonacci numbers. They are Hemachandra, Virak, and Gopala numbers. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that from the... It's actually Fibonacci number, but they have a solution of the Pell equation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Very old, so yes, but, but these poets, many years How before... Thousands of years, I think. Oh yes, yes, yes. Anyway, the interesting thing is that, like Klee was saying, uh, because P and Q could be, ir could be irrational numbers, you are going to have the formations of your, you're going to have a, a generalization of anions. So you're going to have something even more fundamental than anions. Because now you could tweak the, uh, with the P and Q parameters, and you are going to have something actually more general. For example, um, uh, the commutation or anti-commutation relation is given by this, you know. Uh, here, I, I remember, if you replace Q for P, you recover this relationship. So, uh, so when, P, when Q equals to minus P, you recover the anti-commutator relations, okay? Now, the, but you have this very interesting case. When Q is equal to zero and P not zero, vice versa, you get something called um, 
a particle, a very strange, you have something, you have, you have these hypothetical particles of infinite statistics. And they were coined key ons by Greenberg. So maybe when you have more time, look in the literature for these uh, exotic particles called kions, where they exhibit uh, an infinite statistic. Oh, what does infinite statistics then, mean? Uh, 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 where that essentially the spin could be 1 divided by n, when n goes to infinity. So you could have a fractional spin, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something, it's not fermion boson, but it's something, in other words, you have a fermion and you, ha you have a boson. Here you have particles of whose statistics lies in between. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something very exotic. So maybe you could think about this because I think this is worth exploring. You, know? okay. uh, you uh, said that it's a generalization. I was trying to understand because of this. I beg your pardon? A generalization of anions. Yes, oh yes. Yeah. Yes, anions is a very, very particular case. This is more general than anions. Because anions is yeah. a complex uh, deformation yeah. parameter. Yeah, yeah. But here you, you are working with irrational deformations, with PQI irrational numbers, and in some cases you can get yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, think about this because I think this will be interesting for you guys. Okay. Let me just uh, I, I I wrote this a little bit forwards and backwards. Excuse me, I have to go forwards and backwards in time, <laughs> but very because quantum. like a quantum. But let me just go back since Marcelo has been interested in the formations of the Lorentz group of, 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 of SU2 spin networks, you know, in loop quantum gravity. So let's look at the two parameter deformations of the of your ordinary SU2 algebra, okay? So the way you construct this, that you have, you're going to have, you know, these uh, generators and the uh, algebra, I mean, the commutation relations are given by this expression over here. So notice that when Q and P are both equal to one, you're going to have zero divided by zero. When you do uh, L'Hopital's rule, you recover the ordinary commutation relations of SU2. But, the, but now, because Q and Q are not necessarily equal to one, you have a two-parameter quantum deformation of SU2, okay? Now, you could do the same thing, you know, not only with SU2, you know, these Indian guys, they, they all, you can also have a deformation of SL2 well, I wrote down here if you want to write the commutation relations and the, and the co-product rules for, uh, when you look at your uh, Hoff algebra. I'm not going to talk too much about the Hoff algebra. Maybe another time I'll talk a little bit if I, when I come and see you again. But you have the formation of SU1, Dr. Simplected. You could have the formations of the Vira Solo algebra. You could have P, PQ analogous of fermionic, parabasonic, and uh, oscillators. So you could, you, this is very rich. You could play with this in many different ways, you know. But, okay, so let me just go back. Okay, so now I, I covered this. I told you a little bit about what a PQ oscillator is, um, how the deep connection between the Fibonacci numbers as quantum deformations of an integer. Uh, b, this is the Binet formula, and this is the, how you relate powers of T with the Fibonacci numbers. And now, look, the factorial of a number, when you deform it, the factorial of a number is not n times n minus 1, n minus 2. The factorial of this number is given by this product of Fibonacci numbers. So now, um, so I'll let Cleve digest. Take a look and digest. So, yeah, sorry, yeah. that's for P and Q being the... Golden mean and his Galois yeah, conjugate. Yes, yeah. yes. When P and Q... When P is the golden mean and Q is the Galois conjugate, the factorial of a number, when you deform it, is given by this sequence of product Fibonacci numbers like this. This is very this is interesting. Do you mean uh, n factorial PQ? n factorial, uh, you deform it. N, yes, n factorial PQ is defined. The, the factorial actually go inside the bracket. Yeah. Uh, ah, I'm sorry. Uh, is that right? No, 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 the, no. I think, the, yeah. This is not yeah. a deformation of yeah. an factorial. It's a deformation of the factorial function. Yes. Of the, yes. The factorial function. Yeah, yeah. The factorial goes outside. Yes, outside. In other words, le, uh, let's suppose. Forget the letter F here. Forget the letter F here. Forget the letter F. 
So n times n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3 is, is the ordinary definition of n factorial. Now let's deform what I mean by a factorial. Okay, so and then it's given by this product of Fibonacci numbers. Okay, okay. So I want you to think Fibonacci numbers as the formations of, of the integers. So since you've been working with your digital integers and uh, you want to have this geometric number theory, this geomet the, the, how you call the simplex numbers? Simplex integers. Simplex integers, yeah. Think about, uh, it, it, to see if you can relate this with Fibonacci, I mean with quantum calculus. Later I will tell you a little bit about how the binomial coefficients are deformed, how the binomial numbers, how the Pascal triangle is, is deformed. Right. The, you know, because that's very important for because you have the, the simplices. you have the Fibonacci series in Pascal's triangle. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay, I'll tell you a little bit about what the generalized Fibonacci sequences, how you can gen generate them and how it may be related to a 4K plus 1 fold symmetry of a quasi-crystal. Um, I told you a little bit about uh, kions, and, and you can also talk about PQ coherent states, how to deform coherent states, okay, if you are interested in that. Um, remember that this looks like the recursion formula for the Fibonacci numbers. Remember that it's a recursion formula for the Fibonacci numbers, Ray, Are you familiar with that? that uh, if, if you replace n by an ordinary number, you recover the, the recursion formula for the Fibonacci series. But anyway, uh, if you're interested in coherent states, this is how you construct them, yeah. Uh, now, there's something called a non-extensive Salis statistics. Salis is, is a Brazilian physicist. Again, the Brazilian. Another Brazilian who generalized the notion of a statistics to what he called non-extensive statistics. So the ordinary statistics that we're familiar with, uh, we, we add entropies, but in this case, the entropy is non-additive. So there's something very deep uh, in Salis' uh, non-extensive statistics <laughs> that is also related to the, the Fibonacci oscillators, anyway, yeah. But let me just go, uh, okay, so now let me just go to, to the PQ quantum calculus. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit how I'm going to construct the formations, uh, uh, quantum deformations of the Lorentz transformations. And then I'll go to the Fibonacci ch chain, how to construct the Fibonacci chain, which will be useful for, for, for your work on empire fields. So uh, as I said earlier, I define my two parameter deformation of a number by this expression over here. So you could also, if you want to construct a quantum calculus, this is how the um, two-parameter deformation of a, the derivative is defined. Okay, this is how the derivative of a function, uh, how you define the derivative of a function when p and q are not equal to one, okay? When p and q equals to one, you recover the ordinary, ordinary derivative. Then, I'm going to uh, tell you how, to you how do you define the, the binomial formula, okay? So the PQ, the formation of the binomial formula is given by this expression. And notice that there's something very important when you do, when you're playing with quantum calculus, why is it called quantum calculus? It's really called quantum calculus because now X times Y is not the same thing as Y times X. Okay, here the coordinates x and y do not commute. Yeah, this is very, very important. This is key, you know, because now what you do is when uh, you expand this in the, bin in the binomial form, remember when you take x plus y to the power of n, you're going to have pr products of x and products of y, and then you're going, to the, you're going to have the binomial coefficients here. But now because I'm deforming things, I'm deforming everything, in order for the right-hand side to agree with the left-hand side, x and y do not commute. And because x and y do not commute, this is why you are going to have a deformation of the binomial coefficients, okay? So now I'm having deformations of the factorials. So now my binomial coefficients are deformed, and, and, and now they are given by this expression over here, okay? 
Now, if, if P and Q are, are, is, are given by the golden mean and the Galois conjugate, uh, all these numbers over here and on the bottom are given by Fibonacci numbers. Right? I, as I told you earlier. So these n factorials are given by uh, products of Fibonacci numbers in a descending sequence. Okay? So you could think of, you could try to tie this with your simplex numbers. You know, think about, I don't know, I think this is something worth exploring. Um, you go from digital integers to simple integers, and, and then when you introduce the golden mean, you try to deform, and you try to construct a quantum calculus based on the formations of the ordinary integers, and then you recover the Fibonacci numbers. Anyway, think about it. I, I'm just proposing this for you to think about, okay? But the bottom line is that the left hand, you see, if you naively multiply this times this naively, you know, as if x and y commute, you will never recover this, this uh, quantum deformations of the binomial. The reason you don't recover the quantum, I mean, is the, the reason that you recover the quantum deformations of the binomial coefficients is because x and y do not commute. And because x and y do not commute, let me just write it down. You're going to, guess, you're going to have something like this. Yeah. You know, <coughs> now um, x and y, if I remember, in this case, because you have a two-parameter deformation, you have something that looks like this, yx. Okay? So when q and p are equal to each other, you see, when q equals to p, then x, y equals q, y, x. Okay? So now they do, they do not commute. And due to these powers of q, or square root of q over p, this is the reason. Oh, what did I do here? Just take, uh, so if you could take the mouse and close the box. Ah, uh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, scheisse. What that, that the mouse is running all over the place. Yeah. Welcome to our world. Ah, okay. <laughs> we suffer from that. Okay, all okay, okay. So this is why uh, in the left-hand side, this is why you recover the quantum deformations of your binomial coefficients. So this is where non commutative geometry appears here, because x times y is not the same thing as y times x. Because, for, because you see, it's very important to really uh, tie up the world of quasi-crystals with non commutative geometry and, and quantum calculus. Because okay? I remember you guys for many years have been thinking along these lines. Well, I mean, and, yeah. it's, of course, easy to kind of um, understand non-commutative operations with geometry, right? And that's the best place to understand the principles of non-commutative yeah. actions where you, do a, where you do rotations, reflections, or certain operations ah, in, yes, in yes. certain geometric spaces. And um, the, the order yeah. of the operations is everything, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, uh, and now, and now I'm going to tell you how to define the exponential function. Okay, so there are three different ways in you can define the exponential function. One definition of the exponential function is given by this power series, where now you have multiples of p here. Okay, another deformation of the exponential is when you have multiples of q over here. Okay, you have, you know, like if P and Q are equal, are equal to one, you recover the ordinary, uh, you know, tailored expansion of the exponential. Another possibility is when you don't introduce a, a prefactor of P here or Q. So there are three different ways you can deform the exponential, okay? It, it, when P are equals to Q? No, I mean, if P and Q are different, but if you put both P and Q, Ah, then, um, uh, then uh, things don't work out as nicely. No, things, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so I'm giving you three types of uh, exponentials. Uh, and of course, uh, I write little e, big E, and tilde, okay? And then uh, they satisfy the basic identities. Carlos, that's a big tilde. That's the biggest. <laughs> yeah, my, had, my, what a big tilde you have. I had to, I had to. I had to because otherwise, because if I, if, I li if I write a little tilde, you will not be able to. <laughs> Can Latic do it? Huh? Can Latic do this? Latic, there's a Latic. Yeah, there's a, a symbol called Y tilde. Y tilde. Y tilde makes it big, yeah. 
wild till day makes it even bigger. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so notice that when you multiply two exponentials, we know that in, in ordinary calculus, you just add the exponents. Uh, notice that here you have one exponential when you multiply with a second exponential you generate the third exponential okay and so these operations are highly non-trivial uh, because here this is not an ordinary sum because you see these numbers do not commute this is what I mean by direct sum you have to be very careful how you add things okay um, here of course uh, Todd is blocking when you multiply them together, I think you'll get a one over here. But anyway, so uh, notice that when you replace P for the inverse, you know, when you replace tau by the inverse tau, you get phi, you get this. So you have these very beautiful relationships be between the exponentials. Then you can construct the hyperbolic sign version of this exponential. You can construct the hyperbolic sign version of this exponential, and you can uh, construct the hyperbolic sign version of this exponential. So the possibilities are much larger. Yeah. You, the same, you can construct the hyperbolic cosine version of this exponential, the hyperbolic cosine of this exponential, and the hyperbolic cosine version of this exponential. And then you have this relationship, these identities. You know. So now you have to be very careful because you have to write a small c Capital C and tilde, so you have to be extremely careful with the notation. Yeah. Uh, did you know the book from Stackhoff, uh, which is defining deformed uh, hyperbolic function, exponential, and so deformed uh, with phi? Yeah, yeah, there is this Russian guy who sent yeah. you that book. He works with computers, remember? Uh, and you showed me that book. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Yes, oh, I remember. Right. Yes, but remember that. But yeah. he only he only works with the golden mean. Oh, yeah. yeah, but you have to work here with the golden mean and its conjugate. Okay, you need the, this duality. You need the two things. The golden mean is uh, you need the dual. You need the Galois conjugate because yeah. you need to have Dirichlet integrals. So you need the notion of conjugation. Yeah. It's yeah. very very important. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. They are conjugate, but they are both solution of the same equation, yes. so there is no reason to choose one and not the other. Yeah, because I know that uh, Marcelo has been working with uh, the, the roots of unity, the fifth root of unity, you know, because the golden mean is, the is related to the fifth root of unity. So he's working with complex Qs. I'm working here with two Ps. With a P and a Q, uh, you could think, and maybe you can get a complex number out of them. Yeah, I guess... Anyway, this is, but this is, in a way, uh, you will see why this works very nice, because uh, the uh, Stoikov, uh, he wanted to write a version of Lorentz transformation, right? He wanted to do a, a, a generalization of special relativity. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Is he in New York State? Does no, he's in Canada. He's in Canada. Ah, okay. Yeah, I remember if you, uh, when I, I saw you guys about three years ago. You showed me his book. Mm -hmm. like he gave it to you. Yeah, it's yeah. expensive, but I remember. Yeah, he's it. got two books. Yes, yes, yeah, and he sent you the PDF file. I remember. Yeah. Once I remember. Yes, right, yes, right. yes, yes, yes. But he's apparently the first to have deformed uh, all these functions relative to phi. So what you propose is a second. Uh, uh, two parameter deformation. Two parameter. Instead of one, two parameter deformation. Yes, 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 yes. Um, now, uh, okay, so I'm going to bo uh, see whether or not we can construct a two-parameter deformation of the Lorentz transformations. Okay, let's try to do a special relativity in this, in this uh, deformed world. Yes. This will imply that the speed of light will be varying, right? The, in this case, no. I don't, I'm not going to deform the Minkowski interval. I'm going to leave the Mon Minkowski interval intact. But well, I'm going to construct the formations without deforming the, lower, the light cone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what but I'm going to do, but this means that the dispersion relation will be still the same. Um, I have to think about that. I have to think about that. What, okay. What, by PQ the from Lorentz transformations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deform the coordinates 
in such a way, ah, but I forgot the most important thing. Ah, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for uh, the formations of my Lorentz transformations in such a way that I leave the Minkowski interval intact, okay? I don't want to deform, because of course you could deform your, Lorenz, your light cone, for example, or you could deform the Minkowski interval by, the, by introducing numbers here. Let's so, because here I have a 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. Of course, if you deform the Minkowski interval, then you will have to introduce a quantum, I mean, the formations, coefficients in front of the t, the x, and the y. But here, I want to leave this, this, I want to leave the light cone intact. I want to leave the speed of light intact. But I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the formations. I'm going to tell you what t prime, x prime, y prime, z prime are in the simplest case that I'm moving in, in the z direction or in the x direction. So I'm going to look for PQ Lorentz transformations that live invariant my Minkowski time interval, proper time, okay? So I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to boost along the x direction. So I'm going to leave the y and the z coordinates intact. So I'm going to look to see how time and x transform. So in this case, the transformations are going to be much more complicated. You know, and this is how, this is, I was toying with the calculation. This is what they look like, okay? So you see what happens when P and Q are equal to one, the, the hyperbolic cosines coincide. So the square root of a hyperbolic cosine square is the cosine, and you recover the ordinary Lorentz transformation in terms of hyperbolic functions. But in this case, because P and Q deform everything, these hyperbolic functions are not the same, so you have a, a, a very ugly looking expression. But as ugly as it is, it does satisfy composition algebra, okay? So the important thing is that this transformation preserve um, my Minkowski time interval. And now what I want to show is what happens when I, uh, don't worry about it, what happens when I compose uh, I perform one Lorentz boost, and, and I, I perform the second one. How, the, how does the composition of Lorentz transformation is? Because you want to have some sort of group structure or, or quantum group deformation of the Lorentz group. Okay, so it happens that when you perform two successive transformations with two different boost parameters, you get this ugly looking thing, you know, you know, a, and then you get this ugly looking thing, you know. But then when you do the algebra, is, uh, and you want to show that the composition of two uh, deformed Lorentz transformation is a Lorentz transformation with a new parameter, you, your new rapidity parameter. So what you're going to find is that the new rapidity parameter is no longer going to be given by the naive addition of the previous two Rapidity. Does it mean that this kind of successive transformations are commutative or not? Uh, no, they, they should not. They, they should uh, so no. Uh, suppose that I make the, vi the vice versa transformations. Uh, you are right. I, think I will get the same parameter. Uh, I, I, I think should things, things do not. Uh, no, I, I think they do, they do commute, but the only thing is that psi 3 is no longer equal to psi 1 plus psi 2. They are not. It's, it's but it, so it will be always chi three. Yeah, chi three, but it's not equal to chi one plus chi two. Okay. okay, okay. That's the key. That's the key point. Is that the rapidity parameter is not given by the sum of the rapidity parameters. In ordinary Lorentz transformation, the the third rapidity parameter will be given by the sum of the rapidity parameters. In this case, it's not, and the reason is because of the non commutativity. Okay. Um, so then, of course, to show this, you have to do it. Uh, in other words, you have to show that, that the interval is preserved, you, that the Minkowski interval still is preserved. And the algebra gets very ugly. I'm not going to show you. It's, this is a, uh, a lot of calculations. It's really bah, it's horrible. But the bottom line is that the rapidity parameter okay, is not given by the naive sum. Okay? And, and also the same thing if I, I'm working with boost transformations, I could be working with rotations. Again, in this case, the rotations will not add, the angles will not add. Okay. okay. The, yeah. in, coefficient of, 
eta 3 is it the non commutative addition uh, no eta th set, uh, psi 3 yes. is not given by by this it's yeah. not given by the non commutative addition yes yes no in this case the non commutative addition in this case is is given you can uh, this when you use the gas the gas binomial uh, formula the, uh, in this case, when this is to the power of one, is, is, it, it, it agrees with this. Yeah. In other words, this composition agrees with this because I'm raising this to the power of one. Remember when I wrote, I wrote the Gauss binomial expression? When you raise psi one um, O plus psi two to the power of one, in this case you get this. Because when you raise something to the power of one, you get it itself. Okay, is when you raise this to the power of two that things get more complicated, or the power of three. But when you raise it to the power of one, you get this equality. But the bottom line is that psi three is not equal to the naive sum of psi one plus psi two. This is the key point. Okay, okay, um, okay. So, so when p and q are not equal to one, okay. It is only when p equals to 1 that the boost parameter is added, okay? And the same thing with rotations. If you try this with ro rotations instead of Lorentz boost, you will arrive at the same results, okay? That you cannot naively add the angles. And then if you want to write psi 3 in terms of psi 1 or, or psi 2, you, you have a quantum deformation of the arc tangent formula, okay? Here is like an addition law of velocities. In, yeah, but you have to be very careful that, uh, but the bottom line is that psi 3 is not equal to psi 1 plus psi 2, okay? Um, and then you have, a, you can, the velocities add up like in ordinary relativity, but, but, the, but the boost parameters are not additive, okay? The bottom line is that the boost parameters are not additive, but, the, but you do have the same uh, form of addition and subtraction laws at ordinary relativity. And also, when you play with the composition rule for the angles, the, the, the angles are not additive, okay? So let me pause a little bit, you know. So the reason why am I doing this is because, after all, uh, you want to look at um, how, the, how quantum deformations of the Lorentz group. After all, isn't this what you were trying to do, Marcelo, when you sent me that paper a few months ago? You, I remember you were looking for quantum deformation of the Lorentz group and to see how the spin networks in loop quantum gravity, how, how, how to relate that. Let me just to, to what, to the QSN? Is that what the motivation? Okay. Let me just have a little bit of water. And then um, okay, here, well, uh, I'm not going to worry about it, is how to rewrite the Lorentz transformation in terms of Pauli spin matrices, but I'm not, I'm not going to worry too much about this. I'm just going to go to the to the, okay, okay, this, for you, I think this will be important for you. Uh, let's construct the notion of a Fibonacci chain, you know. Okay, this, uh, this guy wrote a very interesting paper by Fibonacci, chain. let me tell you what he means by Fibonacci chain. You wrote it? No, 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 well, I, meant, no I, I meant you, you. Ah, you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what happened is that he wanted to, Work. Uh, he's going to have a, a, an infinite chain of, of particles, but there are only two types of particles. There's, there's the skinny particle and the fat particle, like Oliver and Hardy. So he has like the X particle and the Y particle, but there are only two kinds of particles, X and Y. So inst instead of having a long, long, short, long, short, like in the Fibonacci, here the particles are equally spaced in the chain. The only thing that differs is that their masses differ. Okay, so he uses the, the substitution rule for the Fibonacci, where you have this substitution rule. And in this way, you, re you generate the Fibonacci sequences, right? So remember, the particles are equally spaced, but the only thing they differ is that here you have, uh, you have the particle of max x and the particle of mass y. Uh, here you have the particle of max x, particle of mass y, and particle of max x. Here you have, you know, particle of max x, particle of mass y, two particles of, the, of max x and y. So you, you see what I mean? Is you have a sequence of masses, but they are not all the same. You either 
the skinny one or the fat one. So the ratio of the masses is given by the golden mean. Okay. And it becomes an additive series like of that form and then that form mm -hmm. converges to phi. So meaning in a, it, this is an additive series, right? Uh, well, yeah, if you want to look. So the bottom line is that, so, so you have imagined in, in, uh, you have an infinite sequence of masses all the way to infinity, but the way the, 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 way the masses are distributed is given by this sequence. Yes, okay. because this is our Fibonacci world yeah. instead mm -hmm. of the Fibonacci chain. Okay, this is Fibonacci, Fibonacci world, all the bits are regularly spaced, yes. but depending on the value, zero or one, it will be uh, uh, here, mass one, mx or my. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Okay, so now you want to introduce a, 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 a how do you say, a spring? It's, you, you attach each particle to a spring and you construct an oscillator, right? Um, okay, uh, you see the particle numbers are the Fibonacci numbers. So let, let, let's, because remember, a quantum field, a quantum scalar field is nothing but the collection of infinite oscillators. You know, when, the, you know, when we took those classes on quantum field theory, and really a quantum field really physically is an infinite collection of oscillators. So here you can think of this, you want to construct uh, the analog of a quantum field associated to these Fibonacci uh, particles, uh, you know? Yes. It would, so you could, you could think of a discretized, uh, so then, then therefore a, a discretized, yeah. a set of oscillators with discrete vibratory modes yeah. would be a discretized quantum field theory. More uh, like this time. Uh, well, here the oscillators, they can... They can uh, there, there. That's yes. a smooth quantum field theoretic yes, yes. space. But yes. if you wanted to look at a discretized quantum field theory, okay. you kind of think of your oscillators as having discrete vibratory modes. Ah, so okay. they, so right. then the, per the perturbations of that, yes. of that system gives you different patterns in your, in your discretized quantum field theory. Yeah, yeah. Because here the distance itself uh, the distance could be could be continuous, you know. Um, but the I'm talking about the I'm sorry the equilibrium position of all these particles is fixed, you know. They are discrete distance of each other. That's the equilibrium configuration. And then you kick your system and it begins to vibrate, so the particles can move in a continuous fashion. But the initial equilibrium configuration is given at discrete steps. But okay, so now what you do is you want to do what it. What is the difference between MX and MY? Huh? MX and MY. MX and MY are the masses of uh, the two possible values of the masses of the particles. So there are, they are two types of particles, X and Y. Okay. Okay, the, the Oliver and Hardy, Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> anyway, so you have a, a, the ratio of the masses given by the golden mean. One particle is heavier than the other. Okay. Uh, but there are only two types of particles, okay? I guess if you want to play with tri-Fabonacci tri numbers, you, then you'll have three particles. Uh, but here I only have two, okay? To see. <coughs> so my, the kinetic energy associated with the particles that have max x is given by this, because notice, because remember here, the numbers are, uh, P1 is, is the momentum at side one, P3 is the momentum at side 3, because remember, the way I arrange the particles, I have this Fibonacci word. So remember, the, at side 1, I have x, right? Um, well, let's look at here. Uh, at side 1, I have x, but at side 3, I have x, and at side 4, I have x. Anyway, you see how it goes. You look at the momentums. Uh, K, here, K here is related to mx and m1. Uh, K here, I, I choose K, this, the spring constant. Um, I choose it equally, but you are right. I, I, K is fixed. It's a, I only have one type of spring, okay? One type of spring, because otherwise you, could, you are going to complicate life too. K is my spring constant. Each particle is attached to the same type of spring. The only thing that differs is the mass. Everything is, is like an ordinary oscillator, but the only thing is that you have two types of masses, that's all. Yeah. And, so, and then, of course, if you want to look at the potential, this is, this is your, the displacements of your, of your particles, anyway. 
So what I'm going, to, so what I was thinking of uh, saying is that in, when you take an even number of these um, oscillators, then you will you will have the analog of, I guess, a, a quantum field. So I was just wondering whether or not this could mimic your empire wave field. Okay, this is a question that I'm posing to you, to you, to you guys to think about. I, mean. I think it can, but if, yeah, you, yeah. if you discretize the vibratory modes, then it starts sounding analogous to patterns that would exist yeah. in ours. And you can even uh, allow the discretization to climb to climb down the golden ratio power series so that it can subdivide further and further mm. and yet it would still be um, discrete then it then it would work nicely with the with the project you know the projective geometry because you always have discrete distances that you have to you can't shift infinitesimally small distances with finite um, bound you know finite length windows there's always a countable number of shift vectors that mm. change your your uh, space of, of, of your oscillators which are changed by turning points on and off yes. which is inflating yes. so it's yeah. very discrete the quasi crystal stuff is that we do is like very very discretized so any of our patterns whether yeah. they're closed loop vibratory modes or open yes, patterns yes, they'll yes, always yes. have these discrete things and yes. they'll be able to change along yeah. the golden ratio power series so but pretty restrictive compared to normal oh. classic oscillators. Oh, I see, I see. But it would still work. It could still work with these, this form, but modified in that by making it discrete. Oh, OK, OK. Because Dugan, you told me about your friend that is going to give a talk here about the, the uh, modes of vibration of, of a drum, right? Yeah, it's, it's it's a, yes, OK, OK. And then power with, with like uh, oscillating drums. Here, of course, I only have a Fibonacci chain in one direction, but you could think of two directions of three or four, like your, like your picture. So you can think of these oscillators, a, a ribbon of Fibonacci chains. You know. Anyway, so the idea is, you know, think about this and see, uh, I don't know, if, if this could be a physical implementation of, what's another uh, uh, physical property? You talk about phasons a lot, I remember, yeah. right? Okay, okay, okay. Where are they, the and the, so phasons is a great example of yeah. something as opposed to a phonon, which has a smooth oscillators, mm. right? Phonon mm. vibrations. Yes, yes. But in solid state materials, the f the um, the phason hops yes. at low at very low temperature. They happen discreetly, right? By tunneling, yes. and so there's there's just a tile and then at time one it's in this position and then at time two it flips, right? Where yeah. the points change places I along, see. you know, the yeah. Fibonacci yeah. patterns. I see. I Very see. discreet. Yeah. Yeah. So think about this model. I mean, of course I'm giving you all the... Ref so do you have a solution? Do we have no, I don't have no. I don't have no. Now this, this, uh, this uh, scientist, what he did is because he didn't want to complicate his life he, he took the Fibonacci chain and then he made a circle out of it. Yeah, periodic okay, boundary. periodic boundary conditions to simplify his life. Okay, so so look. And then you would get discrete modes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what he's looking for. Yes. 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 See if the transition yeah. between modes represented matched phase on flips. Yes. Okay. Let's. Let me just give you. Uh, look at this paper. Anyway, you, you have all this with you. Look at this paper. Okay, Richard, could you repeat that? Because this is important when you close it in a circle, because the circle is a compact uh, object. Okay, go ahead. You were saying? And then you'll get discrete eigenmodes, discrete solutions. Yes. And if there's a transition between those solutions, it may mimic a uh, phase on flip. Okay. But okay. We, we won't know until we see the solutions. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So let me, yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. Okay, now an another thing that I wanted to emphasize here is why are quantum groups important? Um, you see, quantum groups are important because it allows you to introduce a, a, co a quantization, a coordinate quantization, without destroying the continuous group symmetries. You see, many people try to introduce a, co a coordinate quantization by using discrete lattices, 
but the price you have to pay is that you destroy the continuous symmetry. Quantum group has the advantage that you can introduce some sort of coordinate quantization. Remember when I have this uh, non-commutation relationship uh, with, while preserving continuously all group symmetries. So quantum groups allows you to um, have discretization and without destroying the continuous group symmetries. So this is probably, this is actually something that you need to uh, dwell on because this is probably something very, very important to keep in mind. Okay, because like I said before, uh, uh, no, b nobody, people used to introduce coordinate quantization by introducing discrete lattices, but prior to the construction of quantum groups, nobody knew how to do that without destroying uh, uh, the, uh, the continuous group symmetries, okay? So think about this. That's why I, under, I, I underline it in, in, in bold for, for you guys to think about so this. Yeah. What, if, what if we don't... So, so I like... Some of us here like to think about uh, abandoning continuous group symmetries yeah. in exchange for discretized... Yeah. Analogs. So, for example, if you have the if you have a, a, a three sphere, well, you could switch to the discretization of the three sphere as yes. as the twenty as the hundred and twenty cell or the yes. six hundred cell yes. uh, inscribed within it, right? Yes. But my question is, if we want to abandon smooth groups, what is it in experimental physics that would force us to uh, to 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 be leery, right, or to run into trouble if we abandon the smooth, the smooth notion of yeah. smooth groups. There's still we still have symmetries that are beautiful, and we have. Yeah, I understand, and, but but the, you see, the the beauty of quantum groups is that it allows you to have your cake and eat it too, as 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 you say in the U.S. With with quantum group symmetries, you can introduce discretization, and at the same time, you preserve continuously the group symmetries. But the price you are going to pay is that you have to introduce non-commutative geometry, non-commutative quantum calculus. But, but my question yes, yes. my question was, what is it in experimental uh, data yeah, that yeah. requires us to be um, religiously adherent to the, to the notion that one needs continuous groups as opposed uh, to symmetric groups that are discretized, such as polytopes? What happened? Well, I, I guess uh, it's a question of, uh, uh, how do you say, a bias? Oh, okay. So nothing experimental. Uh, well, I mean, we, uh, we experience a smooth world. In reality, we know that the world is fractal, right? It's all scale dependent. But like in Lorentz, not relative. In scale relativity, the world looks smooth. But of course, if you go to smaller scales, it, it looks very fractal. Remember that uh, once I, I, I wrote to you an email to, and, I, I, and I pointed out that when you look at the fractal curve, the fractal curve is continuous, but nowhere differentiable. So the, the fractal curve is continuous, but the tangent at each point is, 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 is not, is, it jumps. It's discontinuous. Discontinuous. The angles. Yeah. So you could have a, a continuum world, the fractal yeah, world. That emerges from. But the tangent is discontinuous, so right. you have a discrete jump. So the fractal world allows you to have a marriage of a, con a continuum and, and discrete world. Okay. So okay. this is how you marry the discrete world with the continuum. You recover world. the continuum from, from some discretized limit at the, at the ultra small scales of time and yes, space. Yes, yes, yes. So I think you're right. I think you have to combine both worlds, the continuum world and the discrete world. Yeah. Uh, combine them, yeah. So fractals is a very nice uh, fractal curve. It, it retains its continuity, but the tangent is no. The tangent jumps at every point. It's kind of like a video monitor that has a pixelation at the Planck scale. It would be indistinguishable from smooth, tra yes. smooth trajectories on yes. yeah. Yes, this idea of pixelization is good also because if you really look the pixels as uh, squares, mm -hmm. they are continuous, but uh, but uh, there is no tangent. Yes. When they intersect, uh, there is no continuity in the. Mm -hmm. So this is we see at the level of pixels what Carlos is explaining that mm -hmm. the curve is continuous, 
But the tangent the jumps. The tangent, the tangent is, jumps. They are all so, horizontal or vertical. Yeah. 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 So I think like Kleinert in Kleinert's World Crystals and many other people, I think yeah. they've, you know, the people who had intuitions about discretization in the history of math and f or mathematical physics, of course, they go to what they know, which is crystallographic groups, Lie algebras, Lie lattices, etc., and that failed. Like every time it's tried, most people, a lot of people hate it. <laughs> like Garrett Lisi says, I hate lattice gauge, you know, theory, and and the people, you know, and of course Kleiner, Kleiner, and you know, it failed. It just failed to be physically realistic or to gain traction. But that's the that's the power of quasi crystals with their higher symmetry in some sense, more complex symmetry for a given dimension, it's, it's, as, it's as though it, it gives you all of this um, extra mathematical tools that wouldn't exist in, the, in, the, in just the Lie lattices alone or just the, you know, the, the crystallographic discretization idea. Well, I mean, at the end, uh, this is what Dirac wanted to do, right? He wanted to reduce physics to number theory. At the end, yeah, at the end, everything is number theory. That's true. That's true. That's true. You know. Um, okay. <coughs> yeah. There are different elements on this. Uh, I just point w one more. Is, uh, when you have a continuous symmetry and uh, you have some mechanism to break to a, a finite subgroup, the algebraic structure yes. in the finite. You preserve a finite gauge symmetry, like you break it as you choose to, yeah. because I add or that I add okay. to some of finite subgroups. So you, so that your state, your ground state, has this symmetry, okay. residual symmetry. Yes. Okay. So in this situation, you have uh, that is understand that the. The co correct uh, algebraic structure should be a, a, a quantization of a this quantum deformation of the, the group. Because you have the finite group, but what is the, the al algebraic structure? Would be the, this kind of deformation of the finite group. Okay, let me so about the, the quantum what group is more, a, more algebra than a group, right? Yeah, what, okay, so what you're asking me, if, I'm, if I understood this, what is the quantum deformation of a discrete uh, group? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I would say you break yeah. uh, the continuous symmetry yeah. from a finite subgroup. Yes. No, I, I mean, but because remember in group... So you know that what is the, the group is ah, one of finite subgroup of your continuous group. But oh. what is the algebraic structure? So there are work that uh, show that uh, the, the deformation of the, yeah. the, the group should be the, al the algebraic structure. Yeah. Um. Okay, let, well, let me think about that. Let me think about that. Yeah, yeah Ahmed, you were going to say? No, okay, let me think about that. Let me think about because you know, in this case of uh, lattice or quasi yeah. crystal, you if you think like a gauge symmetry, yeah. that you then this idea that you go from a continuous symmetry to a discrete symmetry. Yes. yes. But you start to think about this discrete uh, symmetry as a residual symmetry of the gauge symmetry. Okay. So it's a kind of gauge symmetry. Okay. Then you ask, what is the algebraic structure? Oh, I see. Because then the yeah, quantum yeah. group is more algebra than a group should. Be. I see. I see. So basically, you're you're. Also, you're looking at some sort of the notion of discrete fiber bundle, something like that? Yeah, it's one picture. Yeah, discrete fiber bundles. But uh, the other picture at the end of the day, it, it sounds like what Marcelo is saying is yeah. that yeah. we may not need groups. We may need, we can go to algebras. Well, I mean, uh, remember, the, a, a group is the exponentiation of, of, of a Lie algebra generator. Right, yeah. A quantum group is a Hopf algebra, no? Uh, well, the quantum group is more complicated because you have an algebraic structure and you have a co-algebra structure. Oh, yeah. You have a co-product, co-unit antipode, and uh, you have the young buster relationship. A quantum group is more complicated because you have an algebraic and co-algebraic structure. 
It's more complicated, more complicated, more complicated, yeah. A, qu a quantum group has m more stuff in it because you have an algebra and you have a co-algebra. Like, yeah. For example, let's say I want to rotate yeah. or reflect or do something um, between one point and another on, on an N sphere, right? And, and I can use these continuous, um, you know, group operations to do, to do what I am allowed to do in that group. Yeah. But let's say we, wanted, we were willing to cast out an infinity of, of such um, operations and in order to recover what we need in our gauge, in our realistic physics, we just restrict ourselves down to, uh, to the vector algebraic operations that can be done relative to an algebraic structure that has an association with geometry. Is that sort of what you're saying, Marcelo? Is that if you, if you, well, what I'm, what I'm just trying to uh, say that I, can, I agree with you and I wanted to help uh, Carlos to kind of grasp it and so I'm putting it in my own words. I'm saying that, let's say that, I, that, that I've got some end sphere, right? And I want to um, bring one object onto another and so I can use the smooth and continuous um, operations allowed to me in this in this um, symmetry group okay but let's say that instead what I want to do is I want to um, cast out an infinity of those of those operations and only do the operations for example that would rotate or reflect one of these op one of these objects onto another and the, the group has symmetry I mean I'm sorry the object has symmetry but if I can get away with doing, with doing what I need to do for my physical model with just that restricted set of, of rotations, reflections, and translations, if I can get away with that, it's simpler and I can go straight to an algebra and not worry about continuous groups at all. Yeah, because remember... Uh, is that, one, uh, is that uh, okay. similar? Uh, yeah. Just with this rotation, you approach the continuum. Right. Which was, and it's the desire, the approximation that you want. Right, because it's at the Planck scale, and so great constellations of those operations can give you a super high resolution approximation of something smooth, but it would not be perfectly smooth. There would, it would be built of angle. And at all angle specifically correlated to, to, iter to the, all these iterative actions in your, in your algebra, in your vector algebra. Because mm. one other thing, uh, I mean, of course, uh, w one thing is to discretize the parameters. Like you, you have a set, instead of having a continuous range of angles, you have a discrete range of angles. Okay, that's one thing. And another thing is w uh, the algebraic structure of the group itself. There are two d d different things. Okay, but anyway, don't worry. About, but okay, I'll, 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 th I'll think about that. Okay, okay. Um, Um, ah, okay, okay, so then I, let me just, okay, let me just, what did I have? Okay, the references, okay, let me just give you the references. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Mahid has done some interesting work with, you know, quantum groups and non commutative geometry, anyway, and smooth structures of exotic manifolds. So I'll give you the reference, and then, of course, um, uh, this, this, and of course the most important, this is the infinite statistics, but the, for you guys the most important will be, probably the most interesting will be this, okay, I'll give you the reference right here for you guys yeah. to look at this Fibonacci chain on the circle to see if you can make Makes sense. sense. Yeah. Uh, you, you didn't spoke about uh, an oscillator, uh, with a quantum oscillator with uh, P equals tau and uh, Q equals uh, the conjugate, and uh, in the reference there is something no about this the TQ oscillator. Ah, uh, but this so is something. PQ oscillator. With, uh, no, no, but this uh, it, it, no, but uh, what happens? I, I try to mingle both things combined, but let me just give you the references because there are two. One thing is this uh, Fibonacci chain with two different masses, yeah. and another thing. A Fibonacci oscillator with this had to do with creation and annihilation operators. They are two se two separate things. Uh, so this is in the paper and then 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, all of the, uh, when you look at the, uh, yes, uh, it's all in the references here. Uh, this one, uh, and then. He did talk about that. Huh? He, you did talk about that. B uh, very briefly at the very beginning. Let me just go back. Uh, let me just go back. Yeah, let me just show back. Okay, uh, this is clear, right? The, uh, the two masses here. Okay, now let me just go back at the very beginning where I, I talk about the creation annihilation operators where I deform the quantum number, you know, uh, the mode number, the mode number, the mode number, the creation annihilation operator. The kind of oscillators I'm talking about is do not confuse the, the Fibonacci chain with the two different masses with this uh, quantum oscillator. They're two, two different things. Although you're right, it's confusing because both of them use the same name. Yeah, yeah, I'm using the same name, but they're two different things. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, let me just go back. Mm. Ah, here, where, da, da, da. Where, where here. Uh, no, here it, it, it's your creation and annihilation operators. Uh, this is how you the quantum mechanical version of describing an oscillator, a harmonic oscillator, yeah. is with the creation and annihilation operators. But it should not be harmonic now. Uh, remember when you quantize, when you, you write down the Schrodinger equation for, for a harmonic oscillator where your potential is one half kx squared. When you solve the Schrodinger equation and you find out the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions, yeah. you can rewrite the Schrodinger operator, which is a quadratic operator, in terms of the AA dagger operators. Remember? X plus IP. Oh, yeah. And X minus IP, remember? It's uh, one plus the other, no? it's a number of, number of operators? The yeah, number of operator is, is your quanta. You start from the ground state, zero. Mm -hmm. Then you apply your creation operator, A dagger, and you create your first state. You, apply, you do it twice, A dagger, A dagger, and you go to state number two. A dagger uh, three, you go to state number three. And then the annihilation operator brings you down, yeah. up and down, yeah. okay? So the algebraic structure of a, when Q and P are equals to 1, when Q is equal to 1 and P equals to 1, then you get that the commutation relation between the A and A dagger gives you 1, or H bar, if H is bar is equal yeah. to, you know. So, uh, so by this, okay, this quantum oscillator algebra has to do with, a, um, a quantum deformation, if you want to look at what, at, as the, uh, at the Schrodinger equation, you try to deform the Schrodinger equation, where now, instead of working with ordinary differential operators, you work with, uh, with a quantum deformed derivatives, for example. So this is what you show in the other slide, with a specific uh, derivative? Piece. Yeah, yeah, you are, yes, yes, something like that, yes. So you're looking at the quantum deformation of the Schrodinger operator. Yes, 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 yes. So you get, uh, I'll give you the reference. I, uh, look at the reference. Oh, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I kind of jumped. Uh, I, I, it was like a random walk today, a random walk. Um, I also uh, think about these generalized Fibonacci sequences, you know, uh, and then, of course, the Binet numbers. Uh, let me just go back, okay, and then, of course, this is the, the, the quantum group deformations of the SU2 here. Here, I give you the reference here, okay? Okay, that will be useful to you guys. And then, um, this is what I talked today, more or less. Okay, so I hope, you know, I hope, anyway, this is it. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you.